Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our discussion on weed sciences. We're going to let a few more people log on to the webinar and we'll get started shortly. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our discussion on weed sciences. To get started, I'd like to introduce the WSSA president, Stanley Culpepper. Thank you so much for joining us as the Weed Science Society of America and the USDA ARS work to offer you the ninth of a 10 webinar series platform. My name is Stanley Culpepper. I am your current WSSA president. Your support of these webinars and in general, our WSSA symposiums has absolutely been fantastic and I wanna thank you. Now it is my privilege to introduce Dr. Steve Young as your moderator once again. Steve is a weed scientist and the national program leader for weeds and invasive pests at ARS. Steve, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Stanley. And uh, thanks again. I, I never get tired of saying this. Thanks again to WSSA for their support of this webinar series. It's been really fantastic. And hopefully you out in the audience have enjoyed this series uh, as much or more than I have. Been learning a lot about weed science, a lot of the research within ARS, and uh, hopefully it's kind of um, expanded your viewpoint, your understanding, and hopefully you've been able to engage with the speakers as well. We're trying to uh, facilitate that sort of thing. Uh, so we're into our last uh, segment. Our third uh, segment in this series is on the impacts of invasive plants and weeds. And last week we talked about the spread and distribution of invasive plants. Uh, we had Dr. John Madsen here with us, really gave a great talk. Um, but today we get to hear from Dr. Dana Blumenthal, who's going to talk to us about one of the most probably common uh, occurrences that everyone is, is, is used to by now, climate change and the effects on weeds and management. So uh, Dr. Blumenthal is going to tell us a little bit about the research that he's been working on, that others have been working on in ARS, and hopefully uh, have some time for some uh, questions and answers or questions and uh, give you guys some answers. And so uh, be, be, be ready to join us here at the end to do that as well. So anyway, um, Dr. Blumenthal has served as a research ecologist with the Rangeland Resources and Systems Research Unit in Fort Collins, Colorado for the past 20 years. Uh, prior to that, he received a master's and PhD from the University of Minnesota. His research focuses on the ecology and management of both native and invasive plant species in rangelands. Much of this work has been directed towards understanding why invasive plants are so successful and what can be done to make them less so. With respect to climate change in particular, Dr. Blumenthal has used experiments to learn how rangeland ecosystems, including invasive species, respond to predicted future climate conditions, and has also used global data sets to assess future invasive species risks. Most recently, he has been studying targeted grazing of invasive plants as a means of adapting management to climate change. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Blumenthal and uh, Dana, anytime you're ready, you can uh, take it away and, and tell us more. All right, let me uh, get the screen shared here. All right, did that work? Looks good. You guys seeing the presentation? Yes. All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Good morning to those of you further out west than I am. Um, thanks so much, Steve, for organizing these. I really appreciate it. I appreciate the invitation and I appreciate um, the WSSA's efforts in hosting these webinars. Um, they've been really informative and interesting and um, 
I'm excited to have a chair, chance to share some climate change work with everybody today. So, um, and then I'd also, before jumping in, I wanna thank all of my collaborators here on this talk. Everybody listed on this talk, they're the people that actually did the work that I'm gonna be showing you today. And they also provided slides that helped put together the presentation. So thanks very much to each of you. So my charge for this talk was to review what we know about climate change in weeds while also highlighting work done by ARS scientists. Um, and it turns out that I had a lot to work with. This was a fun talk to put together because I learned a lot about work that even I hadn't run into even though I work on the subject. So um, my goal is to try to cover relationships between weeds and climate change in both agronomic systems and also natural systems, including rangelands, wetlands, and forests. So that's a lot, of, lot to cover and I'm gonna jump right into it. So for starters, I wanna just get into a few predictions. What do we expect to have happen with weeds as climate change proceeds? There are a few relatively simple predictions that will be useful for providing context. And the first of these is that among weeds, there are going to be winners and there are going to be losers. And we know this because first of all, there are a lot of different types of climate change. These are the ones we're gonna be discussing today, many different aspects to it. Add to that the tremendous variety of plants out there. And this particular picture is just common species of the shortgrass steppe where I work, but one could put together a similar image for pretty much any location. You put all that together and you can expect pretty much any pattern under the sun. Some species are gonna do very well, others are gonna do quite poorly. Another relatively simple prediction we can make is that plants are gonna move around, including weeds, as the climate to which they're adapted shifts, the plants will, if they can, move along with that climate. And this is one example of that sort of prediction from a climate envelope model put together by Bethany Bradley. And what it shows is future invasion, invasion risk for leafy spurge. As you can see, the model, which includes both temperature and precipitation, predicts more invasion risks to the north, more invasion risk in higher elevation areas, um, a fairly common sort of prediction. And by saying it's a simple prediction, I don't mean that this is an easy thing to do necessarily, putting together these models, or that it's unimportant, just that this is a prediction that we can be pretty confident about from the start. Another thing that we can be fairly confident about from the start is that weeds are gonna do okay. They're, when weeds are faced with new environments, they're probably gonna do pretty well. And the reason is that um, to become a weed in the first place, they've had to colonize new environments, whether those are anthropogenic environments, such as agricultural fields, or in, in the case of invasive species, new continents. And the process of becoming a weed selects for species that have particular traits, things such as strong dispersal ability, high phenotypic plasticity, fairly general needs in terms of mutualists. For example, in this picture, we have a native bumblebee pollinating an invasive thistle, even the ability to evolve rapidly. So these are all traits that would be expected to help species cope with global change. So there are some simple predictions as background. Now I'm gonna split things up and talk separately about agronomic weeds that invade croplands and invasive weeds that invade natural areas. Starting with the agronomic weeds, another prediction that we can make is that the diversity that weeds have at their disposal, both in terms of the numbers of weed species and in terms of the genetic diversity within species, that diversity is gonna help weeds respond. When faced with a new environment, chances are some version of weeds is gonna be able to do well. In this respect, the weeds have an advantage over the crop because crops have less diversity. Crops, on the other hand, have an advantage over the weeds because they have managers. So managers can adapt. They can use new varieties, they can use new crops, they can use new man weed management techniques, all versions of adaptation that will probably be necessary to counter the response of weeds to climate change. What about invasive weeds? Well, I think things are gonna be a little bit different there. Uh, one prediction we might make is that where climate change involves increases in the resources available to plants, 
that may favor the invasives, which are relatively fast growing over the relatively slow growing stress tolerant natives they're often competing with. Um, and the examples that we'll be talking about in this talk include elevated CO2 and in some areas, increases in precipitation. Other examples of increased resource availability that have to do with global change, but are sort of outside the scope of this talk, include nitrogen deposition and land use change. Another prediction we can make with respect to climate change and invasive weeds is that management options are often going to be pretty limited. And the reasons there are that the landscapes are pretty large, management goals can be pretty complex, and then economic returns are often low or even absent. All of these things limit manage, kind of time managers' hands to some degree when managing weeds in natural areas. So there are some predictions. Now I'm going to jump into some examples. Um, basically, the way the rest of this talk is going to be organized is I'm going to go through some of those examples of winners and losers, places where people have studied particular combination of combinations of weeds and crops to see what sorts of patterns emerge, sometimes with stronger hypotheses than other times. Um, then I'm gonna back off a step from there and ask, okay, so given those sorts of examples, are there any generalizations in terms of how the weeds respond? And then finally, I'm gonna get to management. What can we expect in terms of management in the future? So that's where we're headed with this talk. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through this by individual global changes, starting with the predictions. Um, this isn't actually a prediction, this is an observation. This is what we've seen in terms of elevated CO2 so far. We've all seen graphs like this before. Starting um, a ways back, in this case, 1760, enables us to see how really dramatic the change in CO2 that we've experienced so far is. And a variety of people have studied how this then influence, influences competition between crops and weeds. And nobody's done more of that than Lou Ziska. Lou Ziska um, was with ARS until recently when he moved to Columbia University, but for many years he worked with ARS studying precisely this. How does elevated CO2 influence weeds? Um, I'll just show you a couple of examples to get started. In this case, um, Lou was looking at a whole weed community within the context of a soybean field, and then elevated CO2 was applied to that soybean field using open top chambers. For a couple of years, this is what's, what happened at the end of the second year. You can see weed biomass on the y-axis for three different versions of weeds, broadleaf C3 species, broadleaf C4 species, and um, broadleaf uh, grassy C4 species. And what you can see is that the broadleaf dicots did really well with elevated CO2. The broadleaf, sorry, the broadleaf C3 species and the broadleaf species in general. And then the grass, grasses, which were C4, did quite poorly. So you get this sort of shift in the weed community with elevated CO2, and not a minor one, a really quite major shift. This makes sense given what we know about C3 and C4 species, um, but it's interesting to see it demonstrated. Here's another um, example in which the com comparison isn't between different types of weeds, but between the weed and the crop. This is looking at red rice or weedy rice, which is a common weed in, in uh, cultivated rice in many parts of the world. And these were grown at three different CO2 concentrations in a growth chamber, uh, 300, 400, and 500, representing pre-industrial, more or less current, and future CO2 concentrations. And what you can see is that the weedy rice was very responsive to the increase in CO2, much more so than the cultivated rice. And this led to greater competition, greater interference from the weed on the crop. This is a result that's, that um, Lou has seen a number of times in this sort of work. He pulled together a few of these different studies um, with different weeds, different crops, um, showing their photosynthetic pathways to make the point that um, in general, across many of this, these sorts of studies, and I think even this slide is a bit dated, um, the, the, the result that he found most commonly was that the weeds tend to do pretty well. And his explanation for this, what he chalked this up to, was diversity. Greater species numbers and more genetically diverse weed populations were able to succeed when faced with this new environment with elevated CO2. So there's a few of many examples of, of elevated CO2 and crop work. And I'm going to switch gears and talk about invasive species. And here I'm back on more familiar terrain. Where this is some of my own work. Um, 
from our rangeland resources and systems research unit here in Fort Collins and up in Cheyenne, Wyoming. This particular study was done up in Cheyenne and it was a, an eight year study that we started back in 2005 called the Prairie Heating and CO2 Enrichment Experiment. Now what this study did was it um, put future conditions on top of present day native mixed grass prairie, future conditions in terms of free air CO2 enrichment to 600 parts per million and infrared heating, um, slightly stronger heating during the day than during the night. And, um, and then we looked at all sorts of aspects of the ecosystem in terms of how it responded, including invasive species. And starting in 2006, we planted Dalmatian toad flax um, into all of these plots. Dalmatian toad flax is the most common invasive species in this part of the mixed grass prairie. We then followed the result for five years. And here's the end of those five years. What we found was that CO2 increased biomass of Dalmatian toad flax 13 fold. It also increased seed production 32 fold and production of new shoots, which it does through underground roots seven fold. So really quite a large response. Just to orient you towards this graph, we have biomass on the top, seed production, and then new shoot production. And then the treatments are colored. So ambient is in black, warming is in red, elevated CO2 is in blue, and the combination is in purple. Remember those colors, because I'm going to use them in a few different slides, um, although I'll keep the key around for you. Um, in any case, you can see that in all cases, the plots treated with elevated CO2, whether or not there was warming, had way more Dalmatian toad flax in them at the end of this period. Now, this is stronger than almost any CO2 response that's been seen in the literature, and it raises the question of why. Well, luckily, while this, you know, in the intervening years, while toad flax was growing, we decided to look into gas exchange measurements, um, and they, they shed some light on this situation. So in these graphs, we have carbon assimilation, that is photosynthesis, stomatal conductance, and water use efficiency for both Dalmatian toad flax and Western wheatgrass, which is a dominant native C3 grass in this ecosystem. Now, um, a little bit of background here. When you're working in dry environments with elevated CO2, um, things are a little bit different because CO2 influences water use efficiency. And the reason it does that is because plants in a dry environment are always facing a trade-off between keeping the stomates in their leaves open to get carbon and closing them to save water. Anytime they're open, those plants are losing water. So many species in dry environments, when, um, when, faced, when, when elevated CO2 comes along, it increases the gradient of carbon from outside to inside the leaf. That makes that trade-off easier for the plant. Many plants end up closing their stomates to save water. Um, and that's what exactly what Western wheatgrass does here. You can look at the stomatal conductance graph and see that the treatments with elevated CO2, that's the blue and the purple, had lower stomatal conductance um, under elevated CO2. In this system, that actually saves water and soil water actually goes up. Um, Dalmatian toad flax, on the other hand, takes a much less conservative approach and in, it leaves its stomates open and instead increases photosynthesis. In both cases, the plants increase water use efficiency, but essentially what this does is it allows toad flax to use the water that is being saved by other species in the system. And it fits with what we know about invasive species. They tend not to use resources conservatively, including water. And it suggests that in dry land systems, that um, species that don't use water as conservatively may be favored by elevated CO2, and that that may include various invasive species. We have seen that similar response with other species I'll just mention, by the way. Um, so as to why we see such a large response to CO2 in this system from Dalmatian toad flax, my best guess is that it's because CO2 is actually increasing two different resources, carbon and water, and this fast-growing invasive species is able to take advantage of that. All right, moving on. An another thing that elevated CO2 can do is it can mess with plant chemistry. You get more carbon coming in relative to, say, nitrogen or other nutrients, then that can change the way the plant is made. Um, and in this particular example, um, we have a weed, Parthenium hysteriformis, which is invasive in Africa, um, Asia and Australia, it's toxic um, because it produces parthenin, which causes dermatitis, as you can see here, and, a, and a, an array of other problems, including ruining meat and milk. Um, 
And in Australia, it has two different biotypes. One is very invasive and one is non-invasive. Now, this is work that was led by Julie Wolf at the Adaptive Cropping Systems Lab in Beltsville, Maryland. It was also in collaboration with Luzisca. And what they were interested in was whether the invasiveness of this invasive genotype and also the, um, its toxicity was related to the CO2 changes that have already happened to date. They looked into this by growing it in growth chambers with pre-industrial CO2 concentrations, roughly 300 parts per million, and current um, slightly more than 400 parts per million CO2 concentrations. They actually, if, I don't know if you can see it in the back, but they, they have um, netting over some of the greenhouses to protect workers from the pollen of this species. And here's what they found. They found that indeed the invasive genotype was more responsive to CO2 than was the non-invasive genotype. And um, what, what I'm showing you here are parthenin concentrations, but it, there was also an increase in biomass with elevated CO2. So the, the plant became, the invasive ecotype became both larger in response to elevated CO2, but also more toxic. Now, this might seem like a fairly unique example, but the main point here is that CO2 can change plant chemistry in ways that matter. Um, there's actually a somewhat similar study with poison ivy at the Duke phase experiment, which became more toxic or more poisonous, I should say, in response to elevated CO2 in the field. All right, that's what I have for you with respect to CO2 examples, and now I'm gonna move on to warming. Here are some predictions from the National Climate Assessment for how much warming we expect in the US, somewhere between three and eight degrees Fahrenheit this century. Um, according to Schwalm et al. 2020, uh, we are tracking the right-hand scenario, RCP 8.5, in terms of both emissions and policies so far. So lots of warming on the horizon. How is that going to affect competition between crops and weeds? Well, there's not a whole lot out there on this particular subject. And so this is an example that does not come from ARS work. Rather, it comes from a really long-standing experiment at the Rothamsted uh, site in, in the UK. This is a wheat study, and what I'm showing you here is wheat yield. This data set that, that they looked at started in 1969 when they started applying herbicides. And the green line here is the is wheat yield without herbicides. And you can see the green revolution happen there in the middle, right around where that black arrow is. And then the um, with, sorry, without herbicides then switches to being the yellow line partway through and with herbicides is the green. And um, what they did was they took this difference between herbicides and non-herbicide wheat yield and created relative weedy yield the way to think about this, the value on the x-axis, is that a value of 0.5 is no competition from weeds. The lower the value, the more weeds are interfering with the, the yield of wheat. And they used a large mixed model to account for a variety of changes in management and then looked at whether there were correlates of climate between, cli whether climate was correlated with the effect of weeds. And they found that by far the strongest effect was temperature. And the warmer it was, and the it was also those years tended to be the most recent as well because it's warming. Um, but the warmer it was, the more weeds were impacting the crop. So why was that? Well, they, they um, explained the result again in terms of diversity and a shift in the weed community. Essentially, they said that, that over time, there was a shift towards weeds that did particularly well with warming and were more problematic for the crop. So there's an example um, of how crops and crop weed competition may change. And we'll come back to that a little bit when we talk about management, but I'm gonna move back to rangelands for the moment. Um, and this is, a, this is an example from the same study I was showing you before, having to do with cheatgrass. I'm sure you are all aware of cheatgrass. It's maybe the worst word of weed of rangelands in the Western US. It's invaded more than 40 million hectares. And there were reasons to think that it might respond positively to CO2, much like we saw with Dalmatian toad flax. It had done that in some growth chamber studies previously, um, and closely related species had also responded to elevated CO2. So we did the same sort of thing. We planted it into that same experiment um, in 2011, and we repeated that in 2012. And um, I'll just show you the result here. Um, what we found was that warming 
increased cheatgrass biomass and CO2 had no effect. This is completely different from what we saw with Dalmatian toe flax. It also did not match our hypotheses. We expected warming to dry things out and possibly inhibit cheatgrass, and it certainly didn't. Let me take a minute to um, just orient you towards this graph. So we did this under four different circumstances. We did it with low competition, so planted into disturbed strips, such as you see on the picture on the right, and in intact prairie vegetation, both, so with more competition. We did it in a dry year, that's year one, and a wet year, year two. And the first thing I want to point out to you is that between these different conditions, from the dry year with high competition to the wet year with low competition, we saw two orders of magnitude difference in how much cheatgrass there was in this, these plots. They did way better when it was wet and way better without competition. Um, but in all cases, we saw the same effect of warming. The other thing I need to explain is the inset bars. So the overall bars represent cheatgrass biomass and the inset bars, the hatched ones in the middle, um, those ones represent seed set. So similar patterns for biomass and seed set. So why is it? What's going on here? Um, as I mentioned, it didn't match our hypotheses. Um, the answer, as I understand it, is that cheatgrass is actually more limited by temperature than it is by water in this ecosystem. And that's because cheatgrass has an unusual phenological niche. Um, cheatgrass is a winter annual, grows starting in the fall and through into the spring, and it's done usually sometime in June in the mixed grass prairie. And um, what that allows it to do is grow at a time of year when there's not a lot of competition from native species. And what temperature seems to do is it expands that phenological niche. It makes it easier to grow at the time when there's plenty of water and not much competition. Um, so there's one other thing, one other aspect to this result, and that is, as I mentioned, it did not respond to elevated CO2, right? We were expecting a CO2 response similar to that seen with toad flax, and it didn't happen. Why? Um, don't have a firm answer here, but our best understanding is that it has to do with nitrogen limitation. So elevated CO2 in this ecosystem not only increases water, but it limits nitrogen. And cheatgrass is a species that really relies on high nitrogen availability to successfully invade. So there's an example from rangelands and warming, and I'm gonna move on now to precipitation. Precipitation is tricky. It's tricky because it, um, there's a lot of uncertainty with respect to the predictions, first of all, and they vary from place to place and over time. So in this case, um, I'm showing you predictions for the US and you, you can see that it's expected to be um, wetter to the north and drier to the south, but it also varies by season. So um, wetter in the winter and drier in the summer. And on top of that, we expect an increase in precipitation variability. Again, these are graphs from the last National Climate Assessment, and um, or the 2018 one anyway. Um, the, um, so in this case, we expect more of the rainfall or more of the precipitation to fall in fewer events. So we have more really wet periods and more really dry periods. You put all that, that together and it's complicated. Coming up with predictions becomes pretty tricky. Um, there are a couple of people trying to do that in our unit. Again, that's the Rangelands Resources and Systems Unit in Fort Collins, and those are Lauren Perensky and David Hoover. They're working up in Northeast Wyoming in the Thunder Basin area, um, where precipitation is important to pretty much all plant processes. And the predictions for that particular area are wetter winters, drier summers, and, um, and, and wetter um, springs in particular, and then drier in the summer and more variability, as I mentioned. So they've set out to study this experimentally, and they did this by creating experiments that, that they switched, I'm sorry, treatments that they switched over time. They had a dry treatment using shelters, which reduced 50% of the precipitation, reduced the precip by 50%. They had a wet treatment, which in, increased it by 50%, essentially take that same water, pump it over to this plot and apply it. And then they switched those every year to create a more variable precipitation regime. On top of that, they had a wet spring treatment that they crossed with all of those treatments. So it's a complicated experimental design. These were their predictions. So these are the main types of plants that exist in the system with annual grass being primarily cheatgrass. They predicted 
that the shrubs would like the spring moisture treatment because they're deep rooted and that moisture tends to get down deeper in the soil profile. That prediction has not as of yet panned out. They predicted that the dominant native grasses, which are fairly stress tolerant, would be more or less stable. They could handle the change, but wouldn't benefit from it. And they predicted that cheatgrass would do well. And that's because it would benefit from the spring moisture, much like they expected with the shrub, um, but because of its phenology rather than its rooting, and that it could avoid the summer drought. And this final prediction did pan out. And that's what I'll show you. So here's a picture of the treatments the former. It's, it's a bit complicated because there was a lag in the response, but the treatments that were wet the year before then showed up with a lot of cheatgrass under the shelters. And the treatments that were dry before still had a decent amount of cheatgrass, um, even though they were dry. Here's what it looks like graphically. Again, I'll take, you, take a minute to orient you to this. The summer treatments that bounced back and forth between dry and wet were VAR A and VAR B. You can see that they change from dry to wet and back to dry again, or vice versa. And then um, the, uh, the spring watering treatment, extra spring water is the blue bar as compared to the orange bar. And what you can see is in 2019, the treatment that was formerly wet in 2018 had lots and lots of cheatgrass. That's the picture I was showing you on the left before. And then you get the same thing in 2020 with the treatment that was formerly wet, um, although only with the extra spring precipitation. Now, this is not as dramatic a response as I was showing you earlier with respect to warming, but um, it is interesting in that cheatgrass was the only species in the system or the only functional group in the system also to respond to this, in, to, to this change in precip. Everything else was stable, but cheatgrass did well. So, that's precipitation. And now we're going to move on to something that we don't usually think about too much in Wyoming or Colorado, and that is sea level rise. It's not something that influences us, but if you're working in estuaries, um, this is something, and you're considering invasive species issues in estuaries, this is something that matters quite a bit. And this is work by Brenda Gruel out at the Invasive Species and Pollinator Health Research Unit in Davis. And um, Brenda is studying a, a, a whole array of invasive species issues and many issues with respect to climate change, but I'm gonna just focus on her work with respect to sea level rise. One of the main invasions of interest there is, is that Spartina densiflora. So there's native Spartina species that are being replaced by Spartina densiflora all up and down the West Coast. And um, this Spartina not only replaces the native, but it colonizes mudflats, which can be a real issue from a conservation perspective. Um, and then finally, it causes additional problems by hybridizing with the native Spartina, um, yielding yet a new, another invasion. And so um, Brenda and colleagues set out to study what would happen to this set of native invasive Spartina species as sea level ri rises. And if in center here, you can see the design they set up. It involved four different salinity concentrations, so more to less to more salty, and then four different inundation levels. Um, and they applied this to all of the different um, Spartina versions, Spartina foliosa, the natives, the densiflora, the invasive, and then the hybrid. Um, and what they found was a couple things. Well, first of all, the native actually handled salt better than the invasive did. So that's a bit of good news. But then the, in terms of all of these stresses, the salinity and the inundation, the hybrid did the best. So what that suggests is that for in the future, management should really focus on this hybrid and the potential for additional hybridization. It's also a really striking example of where hybridization can then influence the outcome of an invasion. They did a very similar sort of study with respect to um, salinity on yellow flag iris. So yellow flag iris is a wetland invader that can form really dense monocultures and choke out pretty much everything else. Um, and it, it is invasive in the San Francisco Delta. Um, and um, that's where they were studying it. And they, they used a similar design with different levels of salinity and different levels of inundation. What they found was that the, 
yellow flag iris can handle inundation just fine, which makes sense for a wetland invader, but that it really did not do well with salinity. And they went into a great, bit, great detail. As you can see here, they looked at all sorts of different responses of the invader, um, all of which added up to it doing poorly in response to salinity. Um, so this is good news. And it's also important to know because it suggests that there are populations of this invader that we should not be spending our time on because they're going to become more saline and that's probably going to take care of the problem. Instead, man management should really focus further upstream on the um, areas that are, are less saline, the freshwater wetlands. So there's just a couple of examples. And again, that's just a snapshot of Brenda's work. All right. I've shown you a whole bunch of examples now of winners and losers. You may have noticed that there was a trend towards the invasive species being winners. Um, and that raises the question of whether or not this is a general phenomenon. Do we expect weeds to generally do super well as climate um, proceeds? Well, there are a couple of meta-analyses that have looked into this. One of them was by Vila et al. Uh, in 2021. And what this meta-analysis did was it included studies that had both crops and weeds in competition with one another um, under different environmental conditions. So elevated CO2, drought, and warming were the changes for which there was enough data. And what this setup allows them to do is look at the effect of the weeds on the crop. That's the top row here. Um, the effect of the climate on the crop, irrespective of weeds, and then the combined effect of the crop and the climate change. And the main result I wanna point out to you is that the effect of the weed by itself is very similar to the combined effect of the weed and the crop. That is by and large good news. It suggests that, you know, that in some cases weed effects are getting worse, but in some cases they're getting better and there's not an average trend towards the worse. Um, I'll, with, with respect to CO2, I'll point out one other thing, which is that CO2 by itself was benefiting crops and just having weeds seems to um, get rid of any potential benefit from CO2. So there's a, a slight interaction there. But by and large, good news. That also raises the question of, well, how strong is this result? You always have to ask that with meta-analyses. And the answer in this case is not super strong. These numbers are numbers of comparisons. It's actually drawn from fewer studies. Um, and so this is the state of the science right now, but is it something to bank on? Maybe not yet. It's something to just be aware of. What about with respect to invasive weeds? Um, here's another meta-analysis, similar type, where the studies included both invasive species and native species and a variety of global changes. Um, and what they found was that in this case, there were two global changes, elevated CO2 and temperature, where the invasive species, that those are the red, um, responded more positively. So anything over a zero on this graph is a positive, more is a positive response. They responded more positively to both CO2 and increased temperature than did the native species. They also found that there was a trend towards this with increased nitrogen and a trend towards the opposite, that the invasive species doing poorly where there was decreased precipitation. So this, at least in part, fits with what I was proposing at the beginning, that where you have changes that influence resources and resources go up, invasive species may do better. Um, again, it's not a super strong result, but that's, what's, that's sort of the sum total of the examples so far. All right, with that, I'd like to move on to management. And here we have a situation where we have lots of data. This is work uh, by Marty Williams in collaboration with Aaron Hager and graduate student Chris Landau, um, based in the Global Change and Photosynthesis, Photosynthesis Research Unit in Champaign-Urbana. Um, and um, what they looked at was herbicide trial data, and they collected tons of it, 3,000 individual trials, 50,000 observations, all from within, within Illinois. And they looked at how that related to weather, because of course you have weather data from, from the same times. And what they found was that um, when you have variable weather, and particularly extreme weather, um, certain herbicides, pre-emergence herbicides, aren't functioning as well. Here's one example. This is um, the effect of atrazine and acetochlor on common lambs quarters. It generally works pretty well. The probability of successful control is purple uh, when it's one, and but then when it gets really hot and really dry, then um, probability of control goes way down. So again, at the extremes, 
And of course, extremes are what we are expecting more of in the future. Um, they looked at the same thing with regard to not the effect, efficacy of control, but the losses to the crop. Um, they took herbicide efficacy, efficacy trials, weather records, put it together with random forest models. And what they found was that crop losses are exacerbated under, again, high temperatures and low rainfall, particularly when those occurred during reproduction. So Marty's conclusion from this is when you, when you take that sort of weed control failure with extreme um, temperature and precip, and you add it to the herbicide resistance issues that we have currently, um, we may have some real challenges with respect, with respect to weed management in the future. So um, 50,000 observations wasn't good enough for Marty. He decided to expand the inference space by going east. They're now collecting the same sort of data from across the eastern US and Canada, um, with the goal being to be able to ask those same questions with even more robust data sets, but also to be able to ask a whole variety of other interesting questions about um, effects of efficacy of control and effects on crops. And um, so stay tuned for Marty and, and colleagues for more interesting stuff. What about biological control? Well, biological control is complicated. In the best of times, you layer climate change on top of that. And obviously there's gonna be a lot of potential issues to consider. This particular diagram uh, summarizes the most important issues to consider. It was done by Justin Reeves, who was a postdoc with ARS um, prior to moving on to Colorado State University where he did this work. Um, essentially, a few things to just think about with respect to biological control and climate change. One is that um, there's potential for change in the phenology, both of the host weed, the target weed, and the biological control agent, and similarly with respect to geographical ranges. And that, what that means is there's potential for mismatches where things were working before they might um, stop working just because the, the plant and the agent aren't in the same place at the same time. Um, there's also potential changes in the plant, such as those we've talked about already, changes in growth, changes in chemistry. Those can then feed back to influence the biocontrol agent. Through this diagram of biological control, and just about to show you an actual example, and this is work by Patrick Moran and colleagues from, again, the Invasive Species and Pollinator Health Unit, but the Albany portion of this unit. They've been studying Cape Ivy in California. You can see here that it's invasive all up and down the coast of California. It's also invasive in other parts of the world. Um, this is a vine that can completely choke native vegetation and kill, killing much of it. Um, and uh, they've been looking into, and ARS in general has been looking into the Cape Ivy shoot tip galling fly as a control agent for this invasive species. And here you can see the fly it comes from South Africa and it invades, it, it sorry, infects the, the shoot tips and forms these galls and then can have really dramatic effects on the plants. Um, assuming I understand correctly, I think this was the releases for this started in around 2018 and the initial results are pretty promising. Um, and, but one of the issues with this type of galling insect is that it can have trouble when its plant hosts start to get too dry. And so Patrick and colleagues decided to look into this in the greenhouse by simulating a climatic drought at different parts of the fly's life cycle and looking at the effect on the fly reproduction. So in these graphs here, you can see um, the ND stands for no drought. And then you have drought during oviposition drought during gall development and drought during the whole reproductive cycle there. And what you can see is the result is that the, indeed fly reproduction on, by all of these metrics suffers under drought. Um, and what this suggests is that this newly released biocontrol agent may have trouble under in particularly dry areas, may also have trouble um, in dry years and, and not be as effective in controlling the invasive species, so that presumably this is something that they're now looking out for in the field. So there's a biocontrol example. And um, everything I've shown you today has to do with prediction. What can we expect to have happen with weeds as climate changes? 
Um, how might that then affect management? And there's one other piece, and it's an important piece, and that's adaptation. What can we do about it? And this is a subject that I'm not going to be able to do justice to, um, partly because I'm almost out of time and partly uh, because I just didn't find as much to work with here. Um, but I'm sure it's something that people will be getting into more and more as climate change goes on. So um, rather than trying to cover this in any sort of comprehensive way, I'm just going to return to an example I know very well that I've told you about, and that is the cheatgrass example, and end with an adaptation piece. So as you saw before, cheatgrass in the Western Great Plains does really well with warming, and it also does reasonably well with increases in precipitation and increases in spring precipitation and changes to more variable precipitation. Both changes are expected to happen, and so things don't really look good from a cheatgrass perspective. So I and others, including Lauren Krensky, who did this precipitation work, have been thinking about what one might do about that. And the main approach we've been looking into so far is early spring targeted grazing. So the way grazing works now in a mixed grass prairie is that the um, cattle go in in late June when cheatgrass is just about done with its life cycle. Um, and then they spend the rest of the summer on the pasture eating primarily the native species. If we can switch that timing around and have the cattle present when the cheatgrass is green and palatable, then we might be able to alter that balance of competition in favor of the native species. This isn't a new idea. Um, it's not a complicated idea, but it is um, something that may work particularly well in the Western Great Plains. And that's because um, in the Western Great Plains, the native species are very well adapted to grazing. And also there's this big phenological difference between the native species which grow all summer and cheatgrass which grows just during that early period like I showed you. So, um, but, and then finally, not only might it work well, but it might work better with climate change. And that's because there are challenges involved in it such as late spring snowstorms that may become more manageable as climates warm. So um, in order to do this, the key is to know exactly when the cattle will eat the cheatgrass. And that's what we've been working on. To figure that out, we set up two pastures, each of them 10 acres, uh, that were about half covered in cheatgrass. Here's a map of the Wyoming pasture. And we grazed them in the early spring. And then we measured cheatgrass consumption over time using analysis of the chloroplast DNA in the cattle fecal samples. And that gives you a pretty good idea of how much of what they were eating when. Then we tried to predict cheatgrass consumption using fairly simple metrics um, that we could measure about the plants and that were probably relevant to consumption. One of them was how tall the cheatgrass was, so its height, when it flowered, and its forage quality. And the answer is we could do a really good job predicting when cattle are gonna eat cheatgrass just from knowing its height and its flowering date. Here's what that looks like. Again, a kind of a complicated image, but what you can see is the points here are the actual data for how much cheatgrass was being eaten. The proportion of the diet that was cheatgrass relative in this case to all the, just the grasses. And then the squiggly lines on top of that are our predictions. And you can see that they match the observed data quite well. And those are predictions just based on height and days after flowering. And then the bars at the top show when the ideal grazing window would be and how it sort of moves around over time. But it doesn't really move around with respect to phenology. Um, we can come up with a fairly simple prescription, which is that the cattle will eat a lot of cheatgrass starting when it's about nine centimeters tall and they can really access it. And going about a month after it flowers, um, because at that point it becomes too poor quality for the cattle to really make use of it. We can also predict which years are best for grazing cheatgrass when it gets tall before it flowers. So again, height and flowering time. Then overall, the cattle select for a lot more cheatgrass in their diet. And yes, I'm aware that these graphs are making lines from only three points. There's another point that's on the way for each of those lines. Um, and then um, finally, we can look not quite finally, almost finally, we can look at how the cattle behavior changes. So we collared these cattle and we looked at how, where they were, when, and when they were eating. And what these points represent on these graphs is look, times at which cattle were eating. And in, in the left-hand graph, we have one in early May when the cheatgrass was tall enough and fully green and the cattle were really focusing on it. And then another case where the cheatgrass was mature in late June, and you can see the cattle really avoided the cheatgrass. Um, 
So this is important in the context of a large pasture because it, the cattle not only need to be willing to eat it, but they need to actually search it out to have effective control. And then finally, um, it does influence seed set of the cheatgrass. Here you can see that in the figure, I mean, in the photo, you can see our early spring grazing pasture where it's green and in the foreground, a summer grazing comparison where there's lots of cheatgrass setting seed, that's that red color. And then if you look at that graphically, you can see that we saw a major reduction in cheatgrass seed set at both sites in all years. So with that attempt to leave um, a somewhat depressing subject on an upbeat note, I would be happy to take any questions. Well, thanks, uh, Dana, that was great. Um, you know, even the, the topic is, is, like you said, it's so vast. And um, obviously we're focusing on ARS research and I, I appreciate you bringing in some other examples, but before maybe people kind of get their questions and we've got some time, we'll, we'll go a little bit longer today just because of the technical issue. But before people are asking, I just wanted to, um, couple, two things, first of all, um, back to your toad flax example, um, where you showed the ability of toad flax to um, consume soil moisture at the expense of the wheatgrass. Um, so back when I was in graduate school and I was working on star thistle in uh, you know, native plant communities, and we saw the same thing. We saw star thistle use uh, soil moisture deep in the profile at the expense of Elmus glaucus and some other native perennial grasses. So my question is, are there certain weeds that or invasive plants that we should be kind of um, focusing on? Or, or do you know of anyone that's working on kind of grouping these, these more kind of problematic uh, invasive plants as opposed to some that are maybe not as, as as much of an issue. I mean, is there any of that work going on to say, we really better be paying attention to these, but these other ones, maybe not so much? Yes, um, so not exactly in the way that I was talking about or you were just describing. So I don't think anybody has tried to do a list where you connect species traits to how they might respond um, So such that I could, for example, predict what else besides Dalmatian toad flax would respond to CO2. I don't mm -hmm. think that information is out there. What is being done along these regards from a management perspective is looking at the weeds that aren't currently in an area and are likely to be in an area. So if we go back, think back to that leafy spurge slide I had at the beginning where we can see that leafy spurge is moving. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those of us in the north are going to get things like kudzu that we haven't had to deal with before, right? Um, yeah. And there are more comprehensive, those models can be automated and made more comprehensive so that there are now, you can go and get lists of such species for particular areas. And the people that I know are working on this actively are in the northeast of the country. Um, there's the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center is where I would direct people to find that sort of information. They have been working on making those sorts of model results accessible to people so that you can then figure out for particular places what weeds are likely coming your way. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I do want to get over to the Q&A session. We've got a couple of questions. Um, someone wants to know, so by targeted grazing, are you referring to both timing and density? I'm sorry, say that again, Steve. I was, so I was trying to read the chat that, at the same time. Yeah, yeah, the question is, it says, by targeted grazing, are you referring to both timing and density? Uh, so, um, yes, we're trying to look into both. And it does, it's a good question because it's likely that the timing matters, but it's also likely that the density of the plant matters. And, and for that matter, the density of the cattle. But we're using, we're, the next step in that project is to look specifically at how it works at different densities of cheatgrass. Like if it's all cheatgrass and you knock it back with grazing, you're probably gonna get more cheatgrass. If there's no cheatgrass, there's no point in doing it. Somewhere in the middle there, 
it's something that's likely to work and we're trying to figure out where that is. Mm -hmm. um, we have another question about the micro base controls for some of these invasive weeds. Uh, they want to know how might those treatments be impacted by climate change, if you have information on that. Mm, this is not something that I actually know about. I, you know, I know that there are active efforts to use microbial controls, um, but the, the interactions with climate change is not something I've come across yet, so sorry. Yeah, we actually have a new, I don't know, Dana, you might not know this individual, um, Rebecca Mueller at the same lab that um, you referred to Brenda, um, she's a, a working on some of these microbial interaction just started. I don't know if she's uh, watching this, but if people would like to make that connection, let me know and I can uh, definitely uh, make that because she's working on this actual topic uh, on microbial kind of interactions. So um, I think that would be a, a good resource. Um, so what else we have? Um, Someone wants to know about the defining the diversity of the weed community. So early on, you were talking about the, the weed community. And so, um, and I know there's some, um, you know, the, the diversity topic. Is it a functional diversity? Is it species diversity? You know, is it genetic diversity? I mean, I don't know. I don't know if you want to, you know, address that specifically to what you are doing, or, or just, you know, in general, um, this this diversity topic. Hmm. This, um, I have to say, that's another question I don't think I can give a very good answer to, um, in part because it's, uh, I think of it as an issue, particularly for croplands. I mean, mm -hmm. the diversity of weeds matters for invasive species too, but. Um, in terms of the climate change response, I do think multiple types of diversity matters. That's the one thing I feel I can, I can say from what I've read. That is that species that have a lot of genetic diversity are in a better position to respond to climate change and fields that have a lot of species are in a better place to respond. And you could go further than that and say, fields that have a lot of functional diversity of weeds, you know, weeds that have di different types, different photosynthetic pathways, for example, um, might be able to respond better. Um, mm -hmm. But I, it's probably all I can say meaningfully. Yeah, yeah, again, I, I think, obviously, we could spend a whole day on this, this topic. So um, again, really great to hear your perspective. I want to finish because I don't see a lot of questions coming at us, but um, unless there's something that just comes up. So, um, the, the work that you've done on the um, with the you know uh, imposing uh, climate change in an, in a field in a setting and and I think that maybe back to the the Dalmatian toad flax example but I'm I know of similar work uh, that has been done with that setup uh, in the um, uh, uh, Moab area I'm sure you know of uh, Jane Belknap and her mm -hmm. research looking at in, in that case, cheatgrass, and she's had this very elaborate setup similar to what you and, and Lauren, I think, set up with, you know, with the uh, the heat and the and the rainout shelters and the and the you know looking at what the effect that has in your kind of um, ecosystem. And I wonder, have you interacted or compared it to to what they've done, or maybe just other kinds of um, systems in general? Have you done that kind of thing or compared it across? you know, in like arid systems or something like that? Yes, um, so it depends on the response one's talking about, but specifically with respect to cheatgrass, there just happens that we have enough examples out there to make that comparison. Mm -hmm. And so um, what we saw was a really strong response to warming. Um, and that same response has actually been seen in two other places throughout the West. One of them is the, is the example you mentioned near Moab, and that was work published by Jane Zelikova in collaboration with Jane Belknap. Um, and then uh, Peter Adler out in Utah found a similar result in a higher elevation area out there. Um, the common aspect of all of those is they're happening in somewhat cooler portions of cheatgrasses range where mm -hmm. it might make sense that it would have a positive response to warming. What I don't have is the other side of that. You would expect that when it, where it's really warm, warming might actually inhibit cheatgrass. And that's what the models show. So you can connect the models the, the, that I was showing you for leafy spurge at the beginning, 
to the warming responses of the experiments and try to come up with a better overall picture. Yeah. But based on the models, you'd expect the opposite response where it's really warm. And the, these, cool, these cooler area experiments would kind of make sense with respect to the models as well. Yeah, and, and it's really interesting to see, like you pointed out, the cheatgrass, it's really benefiting from early season increasing temperature, you know, where that just expands its ability to grow and mature and actually complete its life cycle in a more, you know, expansive state than it had been before. So yeah, really great. There's, there's one other question here um, that I want to touch on. So the individual wants to know about um, receptivity to targeted grazing management by resource managers. Is, are they receptive to that? I mean, what are you seeing as far as, um, you know, those working, applying the kinds of science that you're doing, are you seeing that they're on board with that or what's, what's the kind of trend with that? I'm not sure I could speak to the, about the majority of producers. I know that certain producers are, you know, there's producers that we get the cattle from and they're very interested in the result. Um, I know that other producers are actually way ahead of us. Um, you know, there's people that have been doing this sort of thing for years. They're not necessarily thinking about climate change adaptation, but they're thinking about controlling cheatgrass. And so as I do this work, I hear through the grapevine about this producer or that producer that's been messing around with this already. Um, I haven't yet tried to bring this work out very far. You know, it's, it's, it's new enough, it's not yet published, uh, that I haven't spent a lot of time taking it to producers. So in terms of how many producers will be interested in this sort of work, I don't feel like I can answer that. I'm hopeful that because it allows them to use cattle, you know, herbicides are expensive. If they're in a situation of needing to control cheatgrass, it's a very expensive proposition. So I'm hoping this can be economically advantageous enough that many people will take a look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, we haven't even touched on the whole wildfire kind of, you know, cycle and, and what that means as far as whether it's in the Midwest or out in the in the West. So, and I don't want to go into that because again, that would take probably a lot more time. But anyway, um, I, I know there's some other questions here and I would encourage folks if you would like to contact myself or Dana, uh, please do so. Be happy to, to answer your questions, you know, after the webinar. But Dana, I want to thank you again for your time and your uh, presentation today and just doing a really nice job of the technical issue. I think that went, you know, as smoothly as, as could be considering what happened, but um, appreciate your, your information today. That was really good. Well, thank you, Steve. And thanks to everybody for sticking with it to the end there. <laughs> yeah. And I'll just end today. Uh, so we have our last webinar for those of you uh, who are interested on restoration for managing invasive plants. That's going to be next week. And uh, so hopefully you guys can tune in one last time. Uh, we'll be talking about invasive plants and their impact. So uh, be sure, like I've been saying for the past uh, nine weeks, same time, same place. And uh, we'll see you. We'll see you then. So take care, everyone.